What's up, kids? Welcome back to another semi live Friday at three. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? Well, looks like we've already got some uh, questions bouncing around the uh, the chat. But before we start in on that, let's talk about a couple of things. One, we've got one week left for that giveaway of our ATV throne. I believe the 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 giveaway is going to end next week, but you can still use the, the code John9123 for 100 additional bonus entries. Did I get that right? Yes, John John9123. And it is a Kimpex Nomad cargo seat. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a big Game of Thrones looking thing without the swords. <laughs> so go enter to win, even if you don't own an ATV. I have to excuse the uh, the ongoing construction. Certainly, y'all can hear that. Good grief! But hey, if we're gonna muddle our way through this, let's flip around and look at the questions that I may have missed last week or somebody sent in on one of our channels during the past week. Um, Lean, Leonard Commodore six seven six seven seven five. My 08 GSXR 1000 sat for seven or eight years. Wow. After an accident, okay, and my interest was lost. Hmm. Now I want to get back to riding and went to start the bike. I noticed I needed a new throttle cable. However, the bi my bike won't start. It'll turn over, just no fire. So we changed the tank, still nothing. Then I thought about the injectors maybe needed cleaning, more than likely. They didn't work, and we changed the battery next with no luck. Uh, where should we check next? The stator. Um, well, it sounds like you're kind of heading in the right direction. What I would look at, um, since she told me that it was wrecked, I'm curious what was damaged on it, because I believe it's on the uh, on the, the Jixer. You've got a, a tip over sensor, and now it's supposed to read itself, re reset itself when the bike is put back upright. But I have heard and witnessed that um, when it's a complete rollover or maybe you've damaged that part of the body, that it, it gets damaged as well. And that will certainly uh, not let your machine start. If you're sure that that is not the issue, then there's going to be your usual suspects. And it sounds like you're weeding your way through those. Um, first and foremost, I go ahead and put a set of plugs in it. After that, let's, let's see about the... Um, uh, the injectors and before that you, know, you may want to look at your your fuel pump make sure when you turn on the key into the on position that it spends about two or three seconds priming up if you can't even hear it prime up well then there you go next head down to your injectors um, the best way to test those you can actually take the uh, the, the plug off of there and there's it's just a coil so there's non-polarity but you can take like a nine volt regular just small battery with a set of test leads and just tick it you know, just a little bit. And you want to make sure each one of them at least clicks. Now, is that going to guarantee they're going to you know, let fuel pass through? No, but it will at least tell you that the coil is activating the, uh, the valve on the inside of it. But do those, uh, do those steps. And then if it still isn't starting up, then we'll look a little bit further. Start with that and see what, you, well, no pun intended, and see what you come up with. Bobby, 1965. Uh-oh, sounds like we're born in the same year. Hi, John. I have a 2004 Polaris 700 Sportsman. Just trying to figure out why it's locking in four-wheel drive. It doesn't want to come out of four-wheel drive. If you can help, that we appreciate it. Yeah, an 04. That's one of the older ones. And more than likely, they had, uh, I think it was a, what they call a roller cage. And the original ones were plastic. And they had a, a tendency to fail before they changed them over to aluminum. And when that fails... Even if you pull off the trigger for it to come out of four-wheel drive, it's just going to hold it there. And that sounds like it's what is what is happening to yours. So if you're sure the signal is not being sent, I believe it's from the ECU up to the uh, display and then down to the uh, the actuator on the, the four-wheel drive. Uh, make sure that that, I can't remember the name, the color of the wire, but it's going to be looking for a ground. Make sure that it is uh, not active and then... Well, you're probably going to have to go into and replace that roller cage if memory serves. Julio Mateus, I have a 2005 Honda TRX 250EX. It's getting good, good flow. It has spark and compression. 
it cranks up but won't it cranks but won't start up so i clean the carburetor and put a whole new cylinder head and piston it still won't turn over i need help okay well that kind of kind of counter uh contradicted yourself a little bit he says it, it cranked over but it won't start but then you put in a new cylinder and piston and it still won't turn over all right well then we're not really solving what the problem is um so it's just sitting there uh, sitting there spinning over and it's not and, it, and it's not uh starting up and it has spark as well i would tend to wonder if it's sending that spark at the wrong time then i've seen it happen before where the um the flywheel for lack of a better term which is also your stator or no, that's your rotor um sheared the uh the not the cotter pin but the uh the the crank pin shifted by about 10 or 15 degrees and yeah sure it was sending a spark just at the wrong time but could you really tell that it had been shifted mm -mm, not really the way you can tell though is to take it to top dead center according to your flywheel and then look at your timing marks up on, at your uh at the your, your valves and see see where they're sitting um and that'll tell you whether or not i'm right or not so take a look at that see if those valves are they should be pointing is it like this at top dead center yeah yeah it could yeah i believe they're both pointed out and if they're like this or like this well then you know rodriguez 350z would have to be a have to be a um nissan fan would you <laughs> Hello there. I have a question. My CBR 600 RR 2008 has a temperature issue. It goes up and down like crazy. 95, 150, 95, 210, <laughs> 0, 95. I replaced the radiator, coolant, and temperature sensor, but it's still the same. Did you replace the, um, not the thermostat? Yeah, the thermostat on it as well. I'd say go for that next. Looks like you did everything, uh, uh, everything except that. <laughs> that would probably be my first guess because it sounds like it's having a really hard time regulating the temperature. Just my thought. Um, seriously, but if uh, if it's that that still isn't it, I would wonder if your uh, the the water pump itself is uh, maybe cavitating. Maybe it has a couple of damaged uh, veins in that uh, that pump. So take a peek at that as well. Let me know what you to find. All right, K, long name. <clears throat> I did an oil change on my 07 400EX today and went in reinstalling the oil filter cover. The long bolt would not tighten up and then it snapped. Oh boy. I was using a 3 8 torque wrench set to seven foot pounds. Sounds right. I just bought the bike and wanted to be certain. Any idea well, what I should do? Why the bolt kept spinning and then snapped? Thanks. I uh, love your videos. All right. Well, here's going to be the real trick. Yeah, more than likely there was a couple of threads uh, on either down in the engine case or on the end of your bolt that were galled. Here's the bad part. Yeah, you can time insert it. But you're going to have to pull that outer cover. Those threads, because you told me it was a long bolt, they're going to be way up in there and you've got to be at a flush surface to get to that. So unfortunately, that's what you're going to have to do. And we've got a couple of different videos that show you how to do um, time cert installations. But on yours, you're going to have to dig a little bit deeper into the engine, pull off you know, your clutch and everything else, and you're going to be down to the inner case. You have to get that outer outer case pulled, uh, pulled off of it, unfortunately. Sorry, dude. Last but not least from last week, yeah, this last one, Jason Nix, should I add a fuel tuner to my 2015 Yamaha Grizzly 700? You really only need to add a tuner is if you've exceeded what your ECU can compensate for as far as temperature and altitude. What usually gets you out of the range of that, which is usually plus or minus 10% on your air fuel ratio. That's if you've changed either your exhaust and or your intake system but if you have a stock grizzly 700 i really don't see an advantage in putting a tuner on it because your ecu is just going to try to compensate one way or another 
So unless you've changed the uh, the air fuel characteristic or the the air intake and output characteristics, no, I really don't think you need to put a tuner on it. So all right, that catches us up from last week. Let's dive into this week. All right, guys, Lloyd Wall, how's it going? Hopefully you will be able to answer this another, but the Suzuki TL11 of 1000S has the rotary dampener for the rear suspension. How can I lower the ride height without changing the back shock? Now, I thought I sent you a, a, a um, response on this. I can't remember the name of the company, Lloyd, but they there is one that makes uh, a lowering kit for the, uh, the, that particular year, TL1000S. And it, it was more than just the dog bones. It had a different, um, it had an additional piece in there would allow you to lower it down. And I'm sure they took into account that it has the, uh, the, the, damp the rotary dampener for the rear suspension. I thought I sent that to you. Um, if you would reach out to Hank at our, uh, either one of our channels like Instagram or Facebook, and I'll send him the information, then he'll forward it to you. I just can't remember off the top of my head. Old age, I guess. But yeah, uh, Lloyd, they, I know that I look straight at it. So I know that they make one. I just can't remember who they are. But we'll get you hooked up with them. How's that? Philly D, good afternoon, John. I replaced the front tires and the front brakes and air filter on my Honda VTX uh, 1800. Now I'm having... Oh, uh, a hissing sound. Any idea what that could be? Thanks in advance. <sighs> Replace the front and rear brakes on when applying the front. The brakes hearing a hissing sound. Any idea what that could be? Did you go with a different type um, brake compound? Possibly. I mean, I've 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 run into that a couple of times. Uh, when uh, just changing out pads, if it's on a <laughs> kind of sound on the front end, if it really bothers you that much, well, back up a second. The reason that probably happened, if you did change your pad compound, your your rotors were already embedded with the previous um, brake pad compound. So if you change that, they're going to react to that a little bit differently, and that may be the uh, the hissing sound that you're you're experiencing. One of two ways, either you have to rebed your brakes into those uh, existing rotors or existing disc, which is not easy to do because they are embedded. Um, if you're really wanting to get rid of it all the way, then I would suggest replacing the disc. It may be time, it may not be, because from experience, it takes a long time to really wear down those, uh, those, <laughs> those discs before they have to be replaced. But hey, if you do that and go through a bedding process, and I think we did a, a how-to video explaining that process. So Hank, if you want to dig that one up and drop it in the chat, then uh, then uh, Philly D can um, get his re-bedded re in there. Bradley, how's it going, Bradley? Hey, John, question on aftermarket rebuild kits. Valve stem seals in these kits do not designate, which is intake and exhaust. The OEM seals have different part numbers and clearly look different. Part two below. What would be your recommendation on determining which is which? If the stem um, outer diameter is the same, pretty easy to determine if there is a measurable difference on the, on the stem. The OEM is probably compensating, which I find it a little bit crazy, is uh, for temperature difference. <laughs> You're gonna be a little bit hotter on the exhaust than you are on the intake. Um, if, <sighs> Why do they really need to have, if, the, if all the dimensions are the same, why do we really need to have uh, two different part numbers? They didn't invite me to that meeting. So, but most aftermarket manufacturers, they make a set of uh, seals and they may fit, you know, 15 different machines and 15 different, um, you know, uh, engines, regardless of their make and manufacture. Is your OEM going to be the more accurate way to go, especially on something like this? Yeah, and that's typically what I do. If I'm going with an entire kit and uh, I run into something like this that I know there's supposed to be two different part numbers and they're, they're sending me just the one, I'll use everything in the kit except that for that one thing. I've done it before. I guess they're having a jam session out in the uh, out of the warehouse. Hopefully, y'all can't hear this. <laughs> 
we'll have, we'll have a copyright infringement from uh, YouTube if you can. <sighs> I know I've said it before. I'll be glad when we're out of this building. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Mm. All right, Boy J. Good afternoon. I want to understand the CBR one uh, CBR six hundred R both both Conrad and main bearings chart. With the oh, the crank crank chasing, okay, boy, are you talking about having to get your or set up your um your, your connecting rod and main bearing thicknesses? I think we talked about this last week, didn't we? What? Oh, good grief! Don't worry about that. I think we uh, talked about this before. It's very similar to the Yamaha. That's the one I'm the most familiar with. I mean, you're going to have a stamp on, on your um, engine case itself. It's going to have a set of numbers. And then on the crank, you're going to have a set of numbers that compared to those bearings, your main bearings. And then you'll have another set that correspond to your different journals for your connector rod bearings. Now, each one of your connecting rods is going to have a specific number on it. And they'll determine which bearing you need by, by looking at those two numbers and either adding or subtracting or whatever the Honda process is for determining the bearing. Um, once again, if you'll give me your year on that one, if you're having to rebuild it yourself, get in touch with Hank once again, I'll, I will bring up the, um, the, uh, the service manual for you and then, uh, actually send the process over to you. Sound like a deal? Plus that'll refresh my memory for the next time somebody asks me about it, but it'll be generally the same process as the Yamaha, a little bit different here and there, but basically you've got crankshaft with a set of, a set of uh, specifications and you've got your connecting rods and you've got your, uh, your, your, um, your block over here and whatever those differences are in between those two measurements, those two specifications that determines your bearings. Why, Wyatt Earp. Oh, cool. <laughs> hey, John, just wanted to say, I appreciate your videos. I had to put the, uh, what the videos you put on the R6, you are a legend, sir. Well, I appreciate it. Appreciate it, Mr. Earp. That was a that was a fun project. One of these days, maybe I'll show you where that engine uh, ended up. It did not go back into a motorcycle frame. <laughs> Matter of fact, I may look that up while I'm talking to you. Uh, nah, we'll save that some other time. It'll take me too long to get to it. It's a pretty cool place that it ended up. Actually, there's a picture of it in my office. How about I bring that out next time for a show and tell, Wyatt? Um, why don't you show up next week and remind me <laughs> and uh, I'll pop it up on the screen to show y'all where that motor ended up. Mahatab Shakik. Hi, sir. Well, hello there. And I'm sure I murdered your name. I'm sorry. <laughs> In advance. <laughs> Chris R. How's it going, Chris? Oh, John, it's been a few weeks since I've been able to join the live Q&A, but been catching the recording. Well, good. I'm glad that you have. Oh, Mr. Mahatab is coming back. Uh oh, I by mistake rode my bike about five miles with loose valve clearance. Well, I have caused a problem. No, uh, running it loose is just going to clatter like hell for a for you know. No, but it's not going to damage it. If if that damaged machines, there will be thousands of old Chevrolet pickup trucks and F one hundreds that have never had their valves adjusted adjusted the that have been clicking around for years they would all be in a landfill if they're not already but no it, that that will not have uh, caused a problem for it no matter what your make and model that you're dealing with all right now get back down here <clears throat> chris R. my question for you this week is your opinion on inline fuel filters good bad ugly to run on a carbon machine <sighs> I'm real picky about the fuel that goes into my bikes or my, my car or anything like that. So I'm, I'm sure of it. The, the only reason for a, uh, a inline filter is if, um, you're a little bit, I don't want to, oh yeah, yeah, a little bit careless with your, your fuel source. As long as you're putting in fuel, clean fuel in a, a clean fuel container and it's going straight in your tank. I, I don't think they're really needed. Um, is it going to do any harm? No, of course not. And it, it could save you in the long run should somebody dump some contaminated 
fuel and it, it will at least stop it from getting sucked into your carburetor. So, but I don't particularly need them. Now, if you were constantly uh, filling up at unknown gas stations everywhere, okay, I could probably, I could probably get that because there's, you can't see what's coming out at the end of that hose. But when I'm plopping it straight into uh, my fuel container, without fail, I take a peek down inside of that five gallon uh, gas can, well, not cans anymore, container <laughs> to make sure there's nothing, nothing floating or nothing swimming around there in there that should not be. Hmm. But as far as a downside to it, I, I don't think so, especially on a carb machine. It's usually gravity fed on something like that. And the fuel line is big enough. It's not going to impede it by slowing down its flow. I, so I don't see a downside to it. I just don't find, I don't think they're necessary. Not the way I run mine. Project Med Alexander. Hello, I have a Yamaha 550 Grizzly from 2011. The display lights up blue all over and the engine won't run. Could it be the e, this ECU box or CDU box? <sighs> Definitely. Um, it, it sounds like uh, the, uh, the, the display is not even communicating with the ECU. But just don't run out and buy, and buy another ECU. Everybody says, well, it's probably your ECU. Well, 98% of the time, no, it's not. It's something else. It could be uh, the cabling going from A to B. It, it could be the voltage going to it. It could be the ground that it needs. A lot of things going on that you need to eliminate before you, you know, spend several hundred dollars on a, a, a new ECU. Go ahead and check your connections on it. Make sure it has a good ground. Make sure the pins that have not been corroded or anything like that. Make sure it's not physically damaged because uh, those things typically do not fail unless something they've been through some type of trauma. But uh, eliminate all other possibilities before you order an ECU because once you order one, it is yours. They do not accept uh, um, returns on that. The manufacturer won't let us do it and therefore I don't believe we do either. So that's just the way it is. Our, uh, whoop, about to lose Chris again. Chris R, first trip planned next week for Legends 250R. That sounds interesting. The Little Sahara in Oklahoma. I'm not familiar with that one. I'm going to have to go check it out. The, uh, then again, for ATV Wars, uh, the second week of October. Man, you are busy. We'll be sporting a PZ swag. There you go. And stickers all the way. Absolutely, Chris. I pre we appreciate you representing us out there. Have fun. Send us some photos and we'll get them posted online. That sound like a deal? You know how to get in touch with us. Love love to see you out there playing, uh, playing with everybody else. JG. At, oh, he's, at, he's uh, sending a question to, um, to uh, uh, the guy with the front disc. At Philly D, try Scotch Bright and warm soapy water on your front disc. Then brake cleaner and shop towels until clean. Clean the edge of the disc too. Check pads are fitted correctly. All good suggestions, but I'm um, telling you, it's tough to rebed or change over uh, the compounds when you're swapping them out. I'll be really curious if uh, Philly D uh, went with a different type of pad on there. Just curious. So Philly, if you're still out there, Chime back in and let us know uh, if, it, if I was right about you changing your pad compound. Derek Jerome, learned a lot from your videos. I uh, appreciate you. Well, Derek, we appreciate you dropping in and spending a little time with us. Love doing what we do. But it uh, reaffirms uh, all the effort that we put into this when we get comments like that. So thank you. And you are welcome. Krasimir Petkov, hi there, did a fuel bypass on my 07 Bergman 400. Is that a Suzuki, I think? I think, I, I think that's what it is, or is that a Yamaha? Filter was clogged, so I ran the fuel line through an inline filter, but the pump died on me. Do you think a new one would burn out due to the strain? Possibly. With that particular setup on your machine, yes. I mean, it, it has... It's having to pull, and then if I'm correct, the fuel tank's down at your feet, and it's having to push the fuel up or pull the fuel up 
um, I'm trying to remember where the pump is on that thing, um, all the way up to the, uh, to the intake. So evidently the fuel filter is restricting it a little bit from maintaining its P, um, PSI, which probably is not much, but it is enough to uh, give it a hard time. <sighs> so I would say, yeah, let's, uh, let's get that inline filter out of the way, or depending on which filter it is, maybe calm down on the amount of filtering that it's actually doing, or it can free flow a little bit easier. Chris R. Hey, talking about machines ending up, whatever happened to the red 400EX I was pushing you to put a turbo on? It's been a long time ago. Don't expect you to remember. I know exactly which machine you're talking about. And it has been, it is right now still sitting in a storage container outside of the new building, waiting for the production team to release me on it. <laughs> so I've already ordered all the parts. I guess they didn't know that. And I have a certain direction I want to go with it, but they haven't released me on it. But I have a feeling, I have a feeling that the multimedia team is about ready to let me go on it, especially once we move out of here. And I think that should, should be project number one in the new studio. What do y'all think? I think we should start off with a, we started off this channel with a, a 400 EX. I think we should, uh, restart it in the new studio with the with the same type machine just dive a whole lot deeper into it because believe me y'all have seen it sitting in the corner here a couple of times but you have no idea just how bad it is it is the biggest pos i've ever purchased that that's going to make it fun to rebuild though <laughs> ah the muffin man how tight should the steering head bearings be? It's a loaded question there, no pun intended. Take it all the way down until you can feel the bearings kind of twitch and then back off about a third of a turn. That will get you in the ballpark because you gave me just a generic question, but that's typically how I would do it. I mean, the same way I, I, I adjust trailer bearings. Take it into a, I can start, I can feel the actual bearings in there and then back it off, you know, half of a turn and then you'll be okay. Jake Aldolf, Tally, you're a legend. Only in my own mind, Jake. <laughs> Only in my own mind. Outrageous penalty. Hey, greetings, John. I need to replace a brute 750 top end head gasket where the valves are, but is there kind of a round shaped circle in the middle of the head cylinder? and this part leaks oil. All right, let me read that again. I need to replace a brute force top end head gasket where the valves are, but there's kind of a round shaped circle in the middle with the hole, with, and that part leaks oil. Oh, you added to it. How a flat head gasket is supposed to fix leak on this round shaped part in the middle of a vertical and also leaks. All right, if you're telling me it's leaking from there and it only has a, a old passageway where it's passing through on that particular gasket, I would wonder if uh, you need to resurface the uh, the block to the to the head because um, I get the feeling like that part's warped and it's allowing it to leak. But that's that's what I would think. Oh, boy, Jay came back uh, by by I was suggesting from 2000 up. All right, I've already skipped over. Um... Okay, for it's for 2007. Gotcha. So now I know what to look up for you. Not a problem. Get back to where. Uh... <laughs> Get back to where we were. That old trick: vodka in the water bottle. <sighs> I'm more of a single malt whiskey guy, so. If you see a Coca-Cola bottle in here, well, then you know. But now nah, this is just water, as far as you know. <laughs> Ken, hi, John. Thanks for sharing your expertise and thoughts on repairing, maintaining your ATVs, UTVs, and motorcycles. Your advice is much appreciated. Thumbs up from down east Maine. Well, you are very welcome, sir. I've said it many times before. Love doing what we do here. It's a whole lot of fun. Jolien76, hey, John, thank you for doing this channel. 
well, well, thank you for making it what it is. I mean, I could, I could run around and make these videos all day long, and if nobody looked at them, what's the point? But the channel has done quite well. And next year is going to even be, be even better. I keep say, harping on the fact we're moving into a new uh, studio, but I'm telling you, you're just going to be blown away by it. it it's it's going to be a really good year. And I believe they're kicking off the uh, construction of that particular aspect of the building within a week or two. And I'll see if I can sneak in a couple of photos just to show y'all real quick. Well, all right, guys, really good questions this time around. Well, there always are, but really good ones this time. It was consistent and you kept me here for 31 minutes. That never happens. <laughs> well, with that, I am going to go ahead and wrap it up and uh, do a little research for Boy J, and go ahead and get that information uh, over to you. Sound like a deal? All right, guys. Remember, we're still giving away that Kimpex ATV throne. Go enter to win. You got one week left. Use John 9123 for 100 bonus entries. All right, guys and girls. Everybody have a great weekend, a great week. And God willing, we will see you again next Friday at 3. Sound like a, sound like a game plan? Take care.